recording there we go okay well thank you very much and welcome back to our discussion now about catchers of the negro leagues and one of whom will join the dream team canvas behind me um we have three superb catchers to talk about today we've got josh gibson we've got biz mckay and lewis santop um three very very um highly decorated players um we're going to start with josh gibson a name that I imagine most people are familiar with. If you look at his stats, they're, they're unbelievable. Um, born in 1911, dying in 1947, so, so very early, early death, sadly. Elected to the Hall of Fame in 1972. Um, who would like to start with Mr. Gibson? There's a whole lot of things you can say, say about Josh. And I think, you know, when you think about players that every that almost anybody knows from the Negro Leagues, it's Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson. Those are the two names right. um, with lots of apocryphal stories, as I always say, again, with how many home runs he hit, all of those kinds of things um, doesn't take away from. But as, as we know, um, the stats still are, are amazing. Um, but he was considered by many to be the best at the plate and maybe one of the best behind the plate. Um, Well-known semi-pro ball player before he goes on to uh, make his career in the Negro Leagues. Um, had an excellent arm. Um, for me, one of the most interesting things is Pat Satchel Page said that um, it was hard to find a weakness in Josh. That there just wasn't one. And if you went looking too long, he actually, if you went looking too far, he was going to end up hitting a home run off your way. You were trying to look for it, but that was, that was kind of the idea. And so that's high praise from uh, one of the best pitchers in the game as well. Again, I noticed with Josh that we've got, he, he only played for two teams, which seems to be, again, you know, he was with the Homestead Grays I've got here and then, then the uh, Crawfords. Um, again, I guess that's testament to his, his success and his abilities. Hey, let me just point out, though, because uh, there is a hole in Josh's Negro League stats. He plays in Mexico, and if you believe it's possible, he actually fattens his stats in Mexico. Uh, he's a total, he was a terror in the Negro Leagues, but he's a double terror in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'd like to bring up, though, and this is, Leslie mentioned it briefly, with the glove, he, he really is a solid, you know, maybe not the best, but a, a more than solid defensive catcher. And that, that can be shown by the fact only two catchers caught more games in the Negro Leagues. And, you know, you're not put behind the plate if you're going to be a liability. Uh, Jimmy Fox was moved to, to first base in the majors. Uh, some people think Gibson would have been moved, and I, I share that opinion, but the fact was he wasn't moved and he catches in over 90% of his team's scheduled games. That's another uh, sign of a, of a good solid defender. There's only one catcher with more games. Of course, I think I already mentioned there's only two catchers with more games, but that has a higher fielding percentage. So he's, he's underrated. I think, uh, of course, it's easy to do when you have a bat like that, but, I think he's underrated as, as a defensive catcher. Mm -hmm. uh, what else did I want to say about Josh? Oh, another thing, and he's not the only one that has a family carrying on the, the tradition, but Sean Gibson runs a foundation in Pittsburgh that carries Josh's name, and they serve roughly 300 kids on an annual basis, uh, both athletically and academically, with programs through a nonprofit foundation. And I, I think that, you know, Sean is, is Josh's great grandson. Uh, and I, I think that's another feather in Josh's cap. Uh, I do want to add one more thing about family. One of Josh's big legends is he's the only man to hit a home run out of Yankee Stadium. Well, his son, Josh Jr., once told me that sure he did. And then in another conversation told me, no, he didn't. He says, my dad told me that, that he, he didn't get it out of the ballpark. So I, I find that rather humorous. The same person who has a, a abiding interest to maybe stretch a story uh, didn't do it on the second occasion him and I spoke. 
Now, I, uh, I wrote a story about Negro League ball at Yankee Stadium, and there was a lot of it over a long period of time. Gibson hit homers there. He never won, he never hit one out of the stadium, but so, yeah. one that he hit in the early 30s was, well, one of one of the sports writers there for the Black Papers described it as being 420 feet. The other one said it was 440 feet. So you can figure, and he's a reputable guy. So he had a long home run there. And it, that wasn't the only one he hit there. He annualizes uh, Simez at 42 homers a year. I don't know. I don't, I doubt if anybody in in Negro Leagues, uh, in Seamhead stats, comes close to that. Uh, 185 RBIs a year, 365 batting average. And as Ted said, when he went to Mexico, he did even, he, he hit almost, he hit almost 400 in his recorded time there. He was just, he was just a great hitter. I mean, it, I think the Negro Leagues got really the, hist the history of the Negro Leagues is that they, they had their history, their current history, and then when they went out of business before 1960, everybody sort of forgot about them. And then historians started to write about them in the 70s, and things got fired up again. And then, of course, the first batch of players got elected to the Hall of Fame. I think Page and Gibson being the first two in had a lot to do with establishing Re-establishing the positive uh, reputation of the Negro Leagues. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Very interesting. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's move on to our second catch to discuss. Um, Biz Mackey, a gentleman that I didn't know really anything about, but reading about him was absolutely fantastic. Um, born in 1897, dying in 1965, elected to the Hall of Fame in 2006. Um, the write-up I've been reading on him from the from the Hall of Fame is unbelievable. I mean, I, my main question was was why why is he not known more? But maybe that's my own maybe that's my own ignorance rather than rather than anything else. But what, what would you guys say about um, Biz Biz Mackey? Well, um, I think we forgot to mention it in our intros. It's been a long time. And Leslie and I were both on the committee in 2006 that elected the last 17. Negro League or black baseball people to the hall. And some of them, there was a ballot of 39 people made the uh, owners and players and managers made the final ballot. And some of them, we just looked at it as a half a dozen or eight, maybe said, where are these, where have these guys been? Why are they, why aren't they already in the hall? And you know, it took about I don't know, five minutes per person to vote them in. So we'd have two days more to fight over the rest of them. Uh, and Mackey was one of those is like, gosh, where is he, you know, where's his recognition? And well, this was easy, he's got it. So. He, he, I think it's interesting with um, Mackey, um, he has a long career, it's 30 oh years um, and essentially. And he starts with the ABCs um, and ends up at, on the other end with Newark. So he's got, and all the teams in between that he played for. Um, certainly not the home run hitter. Um, he was more of a line drive hitter. That was what he was. But what he seems to have really have made his reputation for was his his fielding. Um, and if you look at what some of the um, cool Papa Bell said that he was the best catcher that he had ever seen. Um, Hilton Smith said that he was the best catcher he ever had, um, bar none. Um, Campanella said that um, Biz Mackey was the one who helped him um, learn and understand the game. There was a Pittsburgh Courier poll in 1954, not the usual, that actually put um, Biz Mackey ahead of Josh Gibson um, as the leading catcher in the Negro Leagues. And so um, Josh has got the, is known more for his hitting and Mackey seems to have been um, the, the, the much more solid um, defensive catcher. And that's what, though he, certainly a fine uh, hitter as well, but really it was his catching. He had a lot of defensive skill. In fact, he started out, you know, he was at, he was, he played for 24 years. I mean, he was still catching part time for the Newark Eagles in 1947 when he was 49 years old. I mean, that's just a man. That's, it's, that's not a rumor. That, that's a fact. He played for, uh, well, he played for several teams that he played for Hilldale in Philadelphia in the 20s and he was a uh, a lot of the times he was a shortstop he was a he was an infielder early in his career and then uh 
he gravitated to catchers. So he clearly was a very agile guy. Well, he got to be a very big guy. And uh, the Newark Eagles business files still exist. Uh, and there, one of the things uh, around 1946 is the list of uh, the, the order list for uniforms. And, and Mackey has a size 52 shirt. Now, I don't know what, I don't know what, Jacket sizes are calculated at in England, but I like I'm a size 42 sport coat. And Mackie oh, was a 52, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> he appears to put on an ounce or two over the over over the years. But yeah, he clearly was a very uh, uh, agile guy, wh whatever he weighed or however wide he was, and he played in the field for a long, long time. He, and he managed. He was managing the Eagles. He, he's got a, uh, in 1946, he's got a Negro League, uh, National League pennant and a Negro League, uh, Negro World Series championship to his credit as a manager. So he was been around for an awfully long time. And, and he was one of those guys who was always sought after if he was available. If he was available and you could get him, if, the, if he had ch was changing leagues or he was current team had gone out of business. He was one of those people who was sought after and he lasted a long time. And in addition to his managing of Newark in 46 to win the Negro Leagues, in uh, 24, he actually was a player in the first Negro League World Series. And the following year, he was a champion again as a player when Hildale won the second Negro League World Series. And the winter in between those two years, he was on a championship Almendares team in Cuba. Uh, and after that season, which ended early because Almendares was winning by such a margin that they st stopped the season, but they split the team into two, two teams, the All Yankees, which was an American group of players from that team, and the All Cubans. And Judge Landis actually attended one of those games and the Young Yankees with Mackey uh, won five of the uh, seven games played to a conclusion uh, in that series. So Mackey was international. He also, he was the catalyst in the trip to Japan in 1927. And as Jim says, you know, like catching can wear you down. He, uh, he played shortstop in Japan and got rave reviews for his arm and, uh, uh, I think uh, I think it was Neil Poland did the catching on on that tour. So Mackey was versatile, international in in his uh, experience, uh, manager, a player. Can't say enough about him. Oh, but like, one more thing: 1933, the first All Star game, he actually outpolls Josh Gibson. But you must understand, Josh was a 21 year old, you know, third or fourth year player. But Mackey was the top vote getter among catchers in that in that game. All right. OK, thank you very much. Um, let's talk about our last candidate for catcher, who is Louis Santop, um, elected into the Hall of Fame 2006 and dying in, oh, sorry, born in 1889, died, died, dying in 1942. Um, seems like quite the showman um, and superstar I've seen written down here about him. Um, what should we what should we know here? Yeah. He's got one of the best nicknames. Uh, he played early on again uh, as Mackey had for Hildale, which was a team. Well, they were basically a Philadelphia team, but they were their ballpark was in Darby, uh, which was a, a suburb of Philadelphia. And um, his nickname, as I found out the other day from a, a uh, dedicated uh, Hildale scholar, was the Darby Siege Gun. <laughs> wow. And, and we're talking about, you know, a 328 lifetime hitter. Uh, well, his, he, he normalized his eight home runs a year, but now he's, he's playing. This is stats from 1910 through 1926. And as, as Ted pointed out previously, uh, that's you know mostly the dead ball era, so that's really not so bad. His his normalized or what is it normalized? It's statistical. His on base plus slugging is 100. Uh, his uh, OPS plus is 148, which is pretty good. 
So, I, my room has just been invaded by a cat and a dog. I thought I had to go. <laughs> I believe the, uh, the, the minders have gotten them all out of here. They're really nice guys, but they don't know much about baseball. Okay. Now um, we're this. He, he caught both um, Smokey Joe Williams and Cannonball Redding during his, and so he was catcher for both of them. And we're going to talk about Smokey Joe um, in another. Uh, he seems to have been um, fairly a, a well-liked player uh, and very popular with um, both the again with his fellow players and with the fans. Um, his his claim to most of the stories that you read about um, Santop focus on his arm and the strength of his arm and talking about again sort of putting on a show sometimes for the fans um, where he would stand at home plate and throw a ball on the fly out to the outfield um, or he would um, sit behind the plate and just whip the ball to every base just over and over and over again with no, just to put on a show for the fans. Um, so he seems to have um, enjoyed that kind of thing. I think unfortunately for Santop, he died in 1942. So he it, very early on, and I think that's part of the reason a lot of people don't know much about Santop um, necessarily because he wasn't around. Um, and so he doesn't get a lot of the same um, coverage and things that some of the other players do. And uh, I just wanted to add, uh, like some of the players we've had here, you see the early pioneer, like uh, Lloyd, and then Lundy comes along, and then Wells. These three catchers have the same relationship. In the dead ball era through 1919, Santop is the best catcher in almost every category. You know, runs, doubles, RBI, homers, even though he, he you know, his number doesn't stand up. Uh, years later. And then Mackey comes along and, and through 1929, the year before Josh debuts, Mackey is at the top of the offensive statistics for these catchers. And then of course, Josh comes along and changes the whole conversation, similar to Ruth, changes the whole conversation on, on catchers batting. So that that's, a, that's a, an interesting, oh, one more thing that I had forgotten about. I hope I'm right here. Uh, Mackey is a switch hitter, Santop bats from the left side, and Gibson bats from the right. Mm -hmm. Not that you could sit any of them, but uh, a manager could, just like with the shortstops, have a lot of fun with those three catchers on the same team. <laughs> Couldn't afford to pay him, though. Right. I was going to say, yeah. How do you decide which one you sit? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So those are our free, our free catchers for the viewers to choose between Josh Gibson, Biz Mackey, and Lewis Santop. Okay. Well, look. Let's leave that there for today. Uh, our next uh, video and discussion will be covering our last position, which will be the pitcher. So please join us again for that. And uh, thank you very much for watching. And thank you very much, Ted, Jim, and Leslie, for being part of this as ever. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.